So, um, how many here have heard of uh, distributed tracing? Okay. Hopefully, afterwards, you can all raise your hand. <laughs> um, how about Zipkin? Anyone heard of Zipkin? Okay. Good. We're going to make more hands go up also. Um, we have, what, 45 minutes? So, uh, here's what we're going to do. Um, Things and then a demo. I'm Adrian. Uh, I work uh, Pivotal on the Spring Cloud team, but I spend most of my time working on a project, Zipkin, that I started working on um, when I was at Twitter. And um, because all this stuff is, everybody's going to have different um, experiences, I'm going to do a quick review of distributed tracing. And um, mainly, uh, People have had a lot of uh, confusion around what things are, like is tracing profiling, is tracing logging. Um, and actually, I don't know if there will ever be a, a complete answer to this question, because we are always um, inundated with many types of technical terms. But the main idea in distributed tracing is that you are trying to follow the behavior of your request as it goes through the system. It's more important today because um, the answer is more complicated than to the app. Because in a monolithic application, you know the request is going into here, maybe going some threads and to the database if it even does that. But now because we are microservices, it becomes more curious what actually happens with the requests. And usually we're not just curious abstractly, maybe there was a problem and we're trying to do some investigation to, to understand um, whether it has impacts or not, um, or what happened. And the fundamental part of all this working is a unique ID, uh, which we will call a trace ID. It's not so different than a request ID, um, but uh, the main thing is that this allows you to look up um, everything about the request from a structural basis. And that ID plus its little step IDs called span IDs will allow you to actually draw a picture of what the request looked like. So these causal diagrams could be easier to, to understand in some cases than like looking at logs. And so something might look like this where you have uh, you know, a main post request going through, maybe from the client, and then when did it hit the server and uh, where did it hit the service. I don't have a laser pointer so I'll use my laser arm <laughs> so here you can see that the asynchronous storage is actually working asynchronously. So if your goal is to understand that your app is doing what it says it did, then you can look and see, hey, yes. Um, when the developer says, who was me saying, it did asynchronous, in fact, it did do asynchronous. Um, so it can be a good way to understand the behavior of your app, especially as we're trying to do more things pipelined. And you may still not care, so here's some things. Um, I actually have had a luck to talk to a lot of different sites and what, what they actually believe their values are because sometimes um, we're sold tools, like uh, it looks really cool and we're gonna use it, but then we don't really know what we use it for. <laughs> we just know we wanna use it. So the difference between what you think you use something for and then what you actually use it for is what, the, what these uh, answers are. So many times people go into tracing thinking, I'm going to use this to debug my latency. But they come out of it and say, oh, actually, I'm saving time trying to figure out the answer to a problem. And that's actually more valuable than maybe the latency itself. So, and the time in triage, which means like how quickly can I get to the, uh, spending my time in the right place, that is uh, achieved by contextualizing the errors, like where in the system it was and what happened before it, for example, and also contextualizing the delay. Like, is a delay a big deal or not? Um, so, for example, we're used to blaming things on the database, but was it really the database fault or we just want to blame it on the database? And it comes hand in hand that visualization, so visualizing the latency is neat to look at, but if you think of it from a, a value perspective, it helps you to uh, 
to put another uh, way to see uh, SLA. So for example, let's pretend these are services. In a service-related uh, mindset, then you're worried about who's calling you and who you're calling, who's above me and dependent on me and who am I dependent on. And so when you, when you can look up and down, you can actually see uh, see some aspects of like SLA management that are harder to see in like you know graphs and dials. So it's, it gives our, our minds another trick, another tool to um, to contextualize uh, application behavior. And also um, we can draw these uh, architectural diagrams uh, because back in the day it was easy to just draw the diagram. Well, it's hard to get the lines to move where you want but uh, we could just draw them statically. But now if you have more applications, like uh, these diagrams go out of date. So as long as you can track requests, then you can also automatically draw your architecture. And it can be more interesting than it sounds because uh, in practice, people use this to figure out things like, are your deprecated services actually still being used? Because it's easy to see if code deprecation is working as long as you have reference to all the source, you can do analyze, and then it can find who's calling what. And yeah, maybe you don't have access to all of the libraries, but you can get some sense of this. But what's the service version of deprecation? So if you have actually something tracking your request, you can see what's calling the deprecated services. Um, so here's actually a real uh, request. This is a, a trace of Zipkin itself. So the, I'm going to be talking about a tracing system. And, uh, but to make things less abstract, this is a real image. And in this case, um, one of the problems we had was that um, you know, we were using all these fancy libraries and stuff, but we were actually still holding the request too long. And it's very easy to do this. I don't know how many here have, have tried to do like asynchronous programming um, and use like Netty or something else like this maybe. And uh, how many times have you accidentally configured something wrong? <laughs> okay, mainly me. But anyway, <laughs> it's possible. Um, so in this case, we thought uh, we were doing things well, like scheduling and, and in, in a trace diagram, the top is like mostly, most often this shows the client's view, like what, what type of, uh, service time, but also what is the perceivable latency from the client. And so if I can see my work is happening here, 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 and here, then I can, and this line is how long the server is holding the request open, then I can say that I'm actually endangering my app because I'm holding it this much longer than it's actually necessary. And every connection you hold open for a client can cause them damage. It's not like you're breaking them but you're actually causing them overhead. So if you can see that, then you can, it's a lot more intuitive uh, if, when you read the diagram. And then our next fix <laughs> changed the whole diagram because it changed the scale of everything. Because once we fixed the latency of that worst request, because we were able to look up the ID that had the worst performance, and then um, when we found the worst request afterwards, we can find that it's really nicely asynchronously done. And this means that, for example, there's some queuing involved because you can see there's nothing here and then something happens. So you know that your queuing is working. So if you have an a async app, you can actually see signs that it's actually asynchronous, right? So um, maybe if some of you take some things, maybe like Zipkin or whatever later, and you never raised your hand before about misconfiguration, <laughs> you might see you have misconfigured something. <laughs> anyway, uh, service diagram uh, are also interesting. This is just a simple like path-based view of, of all the requests that go to your system, but they're aggregated, meaning that this just shows what services call what services, and if you click on this, then it would show you how many requests. Um, this is actually the service diagram of a dishwasher. Um, so. In this case, uh, there's a IoT Internet of Things, like Samsung Smart Things. They make like the software for the dishwashers and all these things. And so this is the thing reporting its status back to the uh, the integration hub for the devices. And so 
that I just used because I thought it'd be cool to talk about a dishwasher. So how do I turn on tracing? Um, there have been some presentations. Uh, uh, Tanimata-san, uh, uh, Shin had a presentation, Sero on uh, Twitter. He uh, talked about uh, using an agent. Uh, so you can have sidecars and things around your app that can do some tracking. Um, at the end of the day, that's, there, there are different ways that people turn on tracing. Inside all of these things is some concept of the thing that's doing the tracing. So if I'm tracing, then I'm a tracer. <laughs> And these are library functions that are similar to like metrics or logging. But the main difference is, is that it's a stateful uh, operation. Like a logging, you don't have to remember the last log line to write the next log line. Logging is stateless. You can put event and then the next event. You don't need the ordering. Um, same thing with metrics. I just put on another value, an increment. Increment is a, as at least it's a, maybe not stateless, but uh, you don't have to remember values. Um, tracing is, it has that, that word that everybody hates these days called stateful <laughs> because you need to actually pass state through the system because how else could you track something? And um, so it's a little bit more complex internally. Instrumentation is a, is a word that talks about where in your code is actually connected to this library. So for example, let's say I'm using like React or something like this, then the thing that knows where to time things is, is the instrumentation. So that's the glue. The glue that says, this is when the request starts. This is when the request stops. That's called instrumentation code. And so instrumentation is a term that's used also for metrics. So I mean is that you can say you have metrics instrumentation. That's like recording the duration of your web request in the web library. But instrumentation could also be used for tracing. It's just a a type of code. And so how it's configured is based on the base, you know, what you have available. Like if you have an agent, you can use an agent. If you have something like Spring Boot, then you can use the auto configuration. But at some point, it has to be turned on, right? So um, that's the last, last part of it. And why do I even have a slide on this? Because oftentimes we get in our, our uh, ch open source chat room, like I started the Zipkin server, where are my traces? <laughs> it's like, well, it's more like a database, right? This system that's collecting the information is analyzing and doing some things, but still the data has to go there. And so that's, that's what this is about. Um, I'll show a demo. Anyway, um, vocabulary is ever present in technology. And the, the jargon or the weird words in um, distributed tracing, the weirdest word is span. And that's the one that basically says, this is a step of your, of your request. So this is either going through a controller, or this is hitting a repository function, or this is actually representing a server call. A span is representing you know, primarily a duration, but also has tags on it to have lookup keys or to say what the error was. And a trace is just a collection of all of them in order, but also it's hierarchical. Um, and that means you can tell the difference between something that happened after it because of clock, like because that's the next second, and what happened because of cause. And the best way you can think about why that can be a problem, if you have multiple threads and multiple services, then how else do you know that the next call here was this caused by this, or was this caused by this? <laughs> uh, because, it's, because whenever you have queuing, you can have something that happens later. And so it can um, become confused who actually caused something versus when did something happen. And so the key thing with distributed tracing is that it, it can record uh, this, this type of information for you and make it clear what caused what. And that is really important in messaging. So another thing about span, um, you know, they primarily have a name. Um, we usually have a service context, meaning like the service that it's in, maybe the IP address, and some events, and like some, some tags on it to, to help contextualize it. This is not all the information of the request. Sometimes people are like, oh, well, that's not enough information for me. Well, that's probably true <laughs> because uh, you may have other information about your services. There was another presentation earlier 
uh, talking about other tools people use like metrics and logging. And so the, these things have IDs though. So you could actually look up other information like what's in your logs based on ID. And sometimes like the environment uh, identifiers will be tagged. So if you have like Amazon instance ID, then you can go back to Amazon interface and then look up all of its properties uh, also. So it's not trying to copy all the information about your request, just um, correlation information that can help you um, uh, slice and dice. And so we saw that diagram before. Uh, it's showing, you know, the trace will show everything that it calls. And so the verb tracing is actually capturing those events. Um, you know, primarily we're recording time duration and where something happened, but um, it doesn't actually limit itself to that. People uh, will uh, add error, error information. And for the people who really want to know how it works, there's in the type of tracing I'm referring to, um, which, uh, which uh, some of them operate based on a paper called a dapper. But anyway, that was a Google project and um, it had an insight to uh, separate the data and put small data on the request and ship everything else asynchronously. And why does that matter? Because uh, if you have an HTTP request, um, uh, you don't want to add too much overhead because then you're actually slowing down the request. And also if your request goes to many, many services and you, each one is adding more data, then it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's not actually realistic to put, the, put all of this data on, on the request and keep adding like breadcrumbs. So instead, we just put the IDs and only the smallest amount to stitch things back together. Parent-child hierarchy, okay? So here I'm using um, diag these uh, symbols to show the IDs and I'm using uh, stars and diamonds because I don't want to use numbers because these are not numeric. You know, there's no order implied with the numbering or anything. What's all that's ensured here is hierarchical order. So if I'm a root, I have no parent. And if I make any new calls, whether they're going into my same process, like I'm making a, a call from my web controller to a data controller inside the same app, or if I'm calling a different, different app, then I'm still going to put my, my, uh, my ID down. So that's why these are connected in such a way. And so this is small. This is only uh, you know, a few hundred characters to uh, put on the request. It's not a big deal. And so it won't slow down the request. Um, there could be more data collected. Um, if there will be more data collected, all of that is sent out of process. Even that is made hopefully to be not, not too big that would slow down your request. I mean, because what happens when you store a lot of information in your process garbage collectors, other things start slowing down your app. So even the data that's sent downwards is still managed in size so that it doesn't, um, doesn't cause other problems, right? So we talked about trace versus instrumentation. And for people who like a different diagram view, this is the same thing. <laughs> so trace, tracing works by usually interceptor pattern. So. Normally, your user code, if it's a REST controller, will hit, hit get, and then that hits the, the HTTP client, which invokes the request. If you have interceptor, it sits between the user code and the actual, in this case, HTTP client, which will do the recording. This part looks almost the same if you're doing um, recording of metrics for like duration, because it's going to get some tags and things. The only thing that's different, this is actually changing the request. It adds headers, HTTP headers, onto the request. And that way, when the server gets it, it knows where the last request was, and then it knows what its parent is, and that way it can rebuild that graph. Um, later, the data is sent on a process, usually in JSON form, but it doesn't have to be. And um, that, that is uh, you know, only describing this part. So when this thing finishes, it says, Okay, send sometime later the information I've gathered so far. And so this, this will eventually, you know, be visible. And when I say eventually, um, usually people get impatient 
And so they want to see it within a few seconds. Um, so we're not talking about minutes here. So Zipkin, I've said this word many times, it's this open source uh, uh, instrumentation. And excuse me, I accidentally messed up my next slide. Hold on. I have to kill off Brown. I'll tell you why in a second. Um, Zipkin lives in GitHub. So uh, it was originally uh, open sourced by uh, Twitter uh, back in 2012 before I, I joined Twitter, actually. And uh, basically, uh, Johan Oskarsson, a Swedish guy, uh, started the project with some other members of the Twitter engineering. And uh, it was eventually, uh, it was actually quickly open sourced. Most of it was written in open source uh, from the beginning. And it's based on a, a, a paper called Google Dapper, which was written by several people at Google based on a much larger project that still, I think, exists today in Google. Google. Um, in 2015, uh, what happened was the community wanted to actually own the project. So before it was like Twitter slash Zipkin. And so the community named themselves Open Zipkin. And I was actually part of that, even though I was an employee. And then we literally moved, it, moved the repository out of uh, Twitter. <laughs> and um, uh, we did a lot of work after that. It used to be a, a Scala Finagle app, and now it's a Java um, Armeria app. Um, but uh, the uh, 2018, we, we finished 100% uh, of the work for our version two of the Zipkin service. And uh, I'll talk about the new logo. But this is, uh, we have a new logo. How many people have seen our old logo? No one saw the old logo. One, two, two people saw the old logo. The old logo, most people don't even know what it is. It was like a hourglass with a harpoon. <laughs> and uh, now you know what, you've, what you won't see. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is the tip of a spear. Um, so it's still, um, why are we saying harpoon anyway? Because zipkin actually means a harpoon in uh, Turkish. So uh, harpooning the whale. Uh, so uh, that's, that's what the history is about. And we have a GitHub organization with a whole bunch of stuff in it. So anyway, Z Line helped us a lot. So, and I know everyone in Taiwan likes Line. Is that true? You all like Line? <laughs> like Line? Hate Line? <laughs> so I have to make sure I shout out to Line when I'm in Taiwan. And um, be, for example, they help uh, write a completely new uh, UI uh, for the last year. Uh, Igarash Sun has been working mostly on that, but also other people have contributed, and they even uh, contributed our new new logo. And um, so, if you're running a Zipkin uh, site, uh, people ask like, what type of infrastructure do you need? And really, the best answer to that is uh, a like a set intersection. <laughs> What do we have? What can you run? <laughs> and then you want that sweet spot. Like, what is it that you're capable of running? And then what is it that we're capable of supporting as a community? Um, so the best architecture is the architecture you can run. If you can't run the architecture, it's not the best architecture by definition. Um, and some sites are very good at Cassandra. Some sites are very good at Elasticsearch, things like that, right? Uh, some, some sites just want all, only cloud. So for example, our first cloud only, op like cloud only operation is uh, a Google Stack Driver, which uh, Ray helps with quite a lot. So the backend infrastructure is flexible. Um, and the important thing though, is that everybody gets focused on backend architecture because you know, that's what we usually think about. But in distributed tracing, your entire architecture is the architecture, right? Why? Because if your application is reporting data into the system, it's actually a part of the system, without which nothing works. If you don't have data, then you don't have a usable system. So the instrumentation, whether you use agent, you use Spring Boot with a SLUD or something like that, this is a whole part of your tracing architecture. So the whole thing needs to work. So for example, that's why we have metrics reporters like Marconer inside the uh, configuration available for the tracing stuff so that you can keep track of how your whole architecture is working. Um, because if you're relying on it, you, you should be. Um, so, but it, it doesn't have to, be, well, that didn't really render well. Uh, 
it doesn't uh, have to be like a big architecture when you're beginning. One of the things we learned when we went from uh, Twitter to OpenZipkin was that uh, sometimes uh, a large site will make technology that, that works very well for them, but it can be too complex for other people to use. So we decide to make the Zipkin server like uh, Spring Boot app, Java minus jar, start it up. No need even a database to start up and, and try to learn. And the reason that was was because when we interviewed people, we found that some people would actually spend, because uh, I interviewed people actually uh, back in 2000, early 2015, was that people were spending like three months and failing. So they couldn't even get their architecture set up, and they, so they didn't even stand a chance. So uh, that's really bad. <laughs> so we wanted to change that to make it so easy that you can't even, you can't fail to at least understand what it is. Later, you can do things like Kafka and everything you want. But if you can't understand tracing at all, then we've already failed. So um, that's why we package, it's not like we're like preaching monolith, but we intentionally have a distribution that includes the UI and even the uh, in-memory version of the storage, so you can just start it up and try to try to play and and learn learn uh, tracing separately from from the act of learning and architecture for tracing, because they're very two different two different steps. So anyway, uh, Brave is our most popular uh, Java tracing library because this is a Java conference. I have to say what the Java library is. This is uh, layered under projects um, that uh, a lot of people will use. And also, if you're using a Spring Boot, um, how many here use Spring Boot? Then how many here have heard of Spring Cloud Sleuth? OK, so Spring Cloud Sleuth is the automatic configuration of the Brave Java library. And um, so that will be like, instead of using an agent, or even sometimes with an agent, because because agents can do weird things, like even change Spring Boot. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Spring Cloud Sleuth's responsibility is to uh, make some choices to configure that in instrumentation. And so starting from version two of Spring, uh, Spring uh, Sleuth, it, it uh, uses, uh, uses uh, Brave. And um, we have some example projects. Uh, I'll show you one before the end. Um, there's other Zipkin compatible tools. And when Zipkin compatibility is actually an interesting question. So basically, we have a repository called Zipkin API. And inside that Zipkin API project, we have the data formats. We have how to implement our post endpoints, gRPC endpoints. We have all this stuff. So you can like create a competing project. So say you wanted to make a word like hunter and make your own um, Zipkin clone, you could do that using this repository. Actually, there was one called Hunter. It was called Jaeger, actually. But anyway, um, there are other tools that can, uh, can interact. Uh, and when you say compatibility, uh, one thing to ask a question is, is, is it receiving the data or is it sending the data? Okay, Because, for example, uh, Apache Skywalking, which is an agent-based system, that one can receive data from Zipkin. In fact, most APM, uh, how many people know what I mean when I say APM? OK, I will say what APM means. <laughs> Application Performance Management, APM. Sorry about that. <laughs> so performance monitoring vendors are APM. Uh, many uh, performance monitoring vendors will accept Zipkin formatted data. Even open source tools will accept Zipkin formatted data. Um, that means that you can use their, their user interface instead of Zipkin if you want. Um, but most of the time, it doesn't work the other way. <laughs> so for example, you can't use their agent to send to Zipkin server. So uh, this is a... Um, an interesting question if this ever becomes interesting to you, which is like, which direction is it compatible? Compatible this way or this way or both? So for example, how many here use ACA? Okay, there's some people, okay. Uh, so there's a instrumentation uh, library for, uh, for ACA called Kaman. And uh, Kaman stands for ACA monitoring, so ACA monitoring. 
So uh, that's a really cool project. I really like the people who work on that. They're very cool. Uh, and uh, that one actually, you can use that and send directly to Zipkin server or actually other, other projects too and even some commercial projects. Um, there's a, how many here has, have seen the word open tracing? A couple people. So there's uh, other things in the, like especially in CNCF, there's some uh, libraries and currently, they're trying to fold these into a new brand called Open Telemetry, which is uh, not just for tracing, but also doing metrics. And I think also logging uh, is on their roadmap. And so the Open Telemetry project has the ability to export data into Zipkin and also other projects like uh, Jaeger and uh, some uh, commercial tools as well. And when we say the word propagation format, mainly just think HTTP headers. Mm -hmm. So if a header has B3 in it, it's probably a Zipkin header. But um, actually, it's not a Zipkin header. Because B3, it's not Z3, right? It's B3. <laughs> so the, Zip, the server before Zipkin at Twitter was called Big Brother Bird. So Big Brother Bird, B3. <laughs> So, so actually, this header format has been out so long, everybody uses it. <laughs> so we have a specification for this format. And almost everything uses B3 format, even if there's a, some new formats that are also being developed, like W3C uh, has one. But uh, B3, almost everyone accepts this one. And why is that important? Because if one app is communicating with the other app, and they don't read the same headers, then it's broken. Because this one thinks it's a trace. This one, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I'll start another trace. This one, oh, I'll start another trace. And now you don't have a distributed trace. You have a distribution of traces. Because <laughs> I have one trace per process. So it's very important that the headers are compatible. Uh, uh, and uh, so we provide that service. Because since about, yeah, I think even we started documenting it in 2015, because Twitter never documented it. Uh, uh, but we have, uh, have uh, uh, in the same Zipkin-API, you can read, uh, no, I'm sorry, in the one called B3-propagation, you can read about this format. Uh, how many have heard of something called Service Mesh, or, or Istio, or Envoy? So one of the components inside of a Service Mesh is doing like the proxying of your network requests back and forth and doing some other things that are fancier than that. Sidecar. Um, this uh, Envoy is uh, one component of uh, Istio. Inside of there, it has its own little Zipkin tracer. It also has other tracers. But uh, that will send the B3 uh, headers and also the Zipkin format. And so the main idea is if we look back at this architecture, right? You can't just say, oh, my whole architecture is just Spring Boot. Some people can. <laughs> but mainly, you may have other things inside of your architecture. So it's important to have an ecosystem of compatible tools. And so our Zipkin API project and B3 propagation have actually been really delivering a lot of compatibility for a lot of, a lot of tools, including some that, that uh, compete directly with us. So anyway, demo time. Let's do it. Uh, first, I'm going to switch my screen. OK. And then I'm going to change the resolution, because even I can't read that. Can you do it? All right, good. OK. so. Um, firstly, I have uh, a couple applications, and I, I forgot to start up my, oops, wrong one. I forgot to start up my uh, IntelliJ. So when you start with, with Zipkin, like I said, uh, where is it? It's a jar file. So I'll just clear the screen here. And in this case, if I'm running a, a Spring Boot app or even Drop Wizard or anything that can produce a single jar, you just Java minus jar it, and then you wait, and then things happen. And 
So inside of uh, Zipkin, we're, we're actually a Spring Boot application. Um, it's our own choice. And when we're actually uh, just starting, you will have no data in your system. Sorry. And if I look, look here 15 minutes backwards, there's, there's no information because it's just hold in memory. And if I go to, uh, actually, I should have started Keynote a long time ago. I mean, I mean uh, IntelliJ. IntelliJ is not starting. So <laughs> I have an application here. Um, I like to do things very simply. Uh, so when you see any demo from me, there will be very few lines of code in it because I think it's more important to talk about what you're doing. So if we find the source of this, I only have a properties file in my backend app and my frontend app. So because my laptop is just going crazy, uh, <laughs> if I look at the backend, uh, one good thing about the app is so small I can just show you in a terminal what it is. Uh, so all I'm doing is if someone is calling my API, I print out the date, and I just override. I just put some Spring properties here. I could have put them on the command line, but I just don't feel like doing command line work, so I just put them there. Port 9000, and then if I'm looking at instead the front end, then this one has. Uh, you know, knowledge of what the backend's URL is and that it's going to call the API. So this is not a very surprising application. The, actually, by the way, there's no tracing code in here, right? That's a very good property. If you're using a normal dependency uh, injection, like since 18 years of spring now, right, we're not supposed to, like, litter all sorts of configuration code in the middle of our classes. We don't want to, we don't want to see metrics code or tracing code inside of our production app. And of course, our production apps are going to be calling date. <laughs> but no, but seriously, you want to have that as, as auto configuration outside or done by an agent because uh, the uh, actual, actual um, tracing implementations are not as stable and you don't want to pin your um, application to those things. At worst, you can put like an annotation for traced, but I wouldn't recommend putting like tracing code inside of your app. The only thing we really have are a combination of properties. Like in here, because it's sleuth, uh, I just decided to put the 128-bit trace IDs in case I'm using Google Cloud, because they, by default, will use uh, 128. Most people are not going to need 128 bits, but it actually doesn't hurt that much anyway. And also, I'm setting the probability that I'll get a trace to 100%, because there's this thing called sampling. Sampling means that not always do you want to have a trace? If you have a very small amount of traffic, maybe uh, you can take 100% of those requests. But let's say your line, if, if your line and like everyone is sending stickers back and forth and you have a trace for every one of the time that someone is chatting, now you have a manage a system bigger than line. <laughs> right? So you need to rate limit in some way. So for um, for the Sleuth and Zipkin, most Zipkin tracers, including things like uh, the open telemetry I talked about, almost all of them have like a rate limiter or some sort of component to, to uh, save you from having to buy a system for tracing that's more expensive than your production. <laughs> the other thing you see here is we have a log expression. How many here have been like messing with log patterns? You know, you, you have some things that you, you would do like these are special characters to say, okay, put in the date and put in the thread ID. Um, so if you want your trace and ID to be in the logs, so there's a way to do that. You just put a, a variable. You don't have to do that now. But that way, just in case you see an ID in your log, you can copy paste that into the tracing system. Okay, now IntelliJ has started. Uh, let me open up the project. Actually, I don't even need to open up anymore. <laughs> I just showed you everything. Let's just start it, OK? So I'll start the front end, the back end. So this is just using Maven. I still use Maven. I like Maven. And uh, we actually, this application 
Um, it's open source, of course. Everything we do is open source. And the, um, what's neat about this is actually this demo that I'm using for you right now. We actually have integrated it into a micro benchmark framework for Zipkin. <laughs> so if we want to test Zipkin itself, we actually bundle these demo app into Docker containers and then smash Zipkin by hitting this demo app very fast. Uh, so we actually use this in many ways. Um, so anyway, I've got the app. Uh, I'll hit it with the, the web request, 8081. And uh, wow, it actually thinks I'm still in Singapore time zone. And if I look here, then I have some, uh, some requests going on. And interestingly, you'll see that sometimes I don't have a trace ID, and sometimes I do have a trace ID. It's important to know that not all of your app is traced. Only the parts are instrumented or traced. How many here have used like authentication filter or a metrics filter? You know filters have order, right? Something happens before another filter, then the next one can see what the previous one did. So the same thing happens in a tracing. The only thing that's traced is where it can see. And there are things that, that are happened before the request start. There's also things like garbage collection. Garbage collection is not a request, right? That happens alongside. So it's just trivia, but um, it's, it's also neat to think about it. And you can see it in your logs. So if I look up one of the trace IDs, um, then I can see the service diagram. And for example, I can see this is when it called on the back end. Maybe I can click here. OK, the server uh, started the request at this time, which was five milliseconds into the request. And the server finished uh, relative that, that much time. Here are the tags. And if I, you know, what do we do in demos? We have load generator like this. Uh, and <laughs> we hit the thing many times, right? And so then I can look at many traces, and I can look at them from duration. Your real app is going to have more interesting stuff than this. And if I look at the dependency diagram, wow, here's my architecture. Front end calls back end, <laughs> right? I, I, I have so much insight now. I, I, and also, uh, but one thing Zipkin also provides as a public service, we have like the Zipkin API documented so people can compete with us easier. We have the B3 propagation specification. We also give test data. And because a lot of people come up with a question, like I don't have an architecture yet, and so I, I don't know, what is this stuff? Or like we get academic people or, or want to do research about tracing or security professionals wondering what tracing is. So we have a, uh, we've asked some people to give us some sample traces. So for example, who here would like to know what a uh, Netflix request looks like? Huh? <laughs> Why not? So just copy, paste, enter. And um, because Netflix is one of uh, Zipkin sites, and we can look at, at their stuff. And actually, I'm going to start, because I flooded my server with all those things. I'll just shut it down and, and start it up again so it's only Netflix. And then uh, do it again. All right. So I'm going to look here. And so here's, one, here's, a, here's a simple API request. This is not obviously their most sophisticated request. But this is one where it would show some components. And if I want to see uh, like a little bit wider. Um, so this is one of the session services. And it, if I'm looking at, um, how many here have heard of OAuth flow? OAuth? OAuth authorization stuff. So that can be really tricky, right? You have things that are crossing requests. And um, so S Samsung SmartThings, they actually donated to the project a actual um, two things uh, that are very interesting with tracing. Um, because, um, well, let's start with this one. And I think I'm out of time. But I think you'll like it, so why not? Uh, <laughs> so we'll go, oops. Wrong query, because this is an old trace. I have to actually pull up a old old one. Okay. Uh, so this is a really big trace. 
for OAuth flow. Uh, and it's going to hit all these types of services. But here's the, here's the web authentication aspect. So this is where it's actually posting into a service. And then this results actually in a lot of uh, calls to a uh, authorization backend that's bit bound by Cassandra. And um, actually, a lot of times, if you have a large ecosystem, uh, you'll actually have quite large traces. So they, they can span quite, quite a distance. And so we now have uh, a new, new UI. This is not actually landed yet, but you can see on Twitter, this is a new API called reroute. It means that we can pretend that the request started here. And so here, I decided to make it start at the OAuth authorization. And that way, it makes a lot of things easier to see. And see how it's hard to tell the time happened because it's, it's a couple milliseconds. I could just go here and then zoom it in, and then it's easier to diagnose. So anyway, I hope that's interesting. And um, there's, this stuff is all open source, and you can uh, come and join our community, which is the next slide. So um, first, start simple. Um, just use a local process. You don't have to do anything fancy. You can pretend it's fancy by uploading the trace from, from Samsung. <laughs> and, uh, but you can run your own stuff. Uh, you can get into the fancy stuff later. Um, we have a support channel called Gitter. Gitter is, is a chat room. So it's gitter.im. And uh, you, because the main thing is to understand you're not alone. A lot of people have, have uh, started. I didn't know anything about tracing when I started. So did everybody else. And so if you're interested in this stuff, you can, you can give it a try. And if you like our stuff, uh, click on the star button. But anyway, thank you for letting me borrow uh, so much t of your time. And if you have any questions and I have time to take them, uh, then just go for it. No one's kicking me off, so any question? OK, the question was about Elasticsearch. And is there a way to integrate this with my like Kibana and other things like that? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So one of our supported uh, storage backends is, um, is, is uh, Elasticsearch. So firstly, we store in a, in a daily index when we're, when we're using Elasticsearch. And, um, and it's all, uh, it has a uh, millisecond ID that's compatible with Kibana so that you can use the times the time uh, range. And so uh, the first thing is, is that yes, uh, we can use Elasticsearch. And we have some details on that inside of our GitHub uh, repository. But you can also ask some questions. Um, another thing I should mention is sometimes I do a, a site uh, presentation about how different Zipkin sites work. And we have on our openzipkin.github.io, we have a wiki here. And inside, I, I will just tweet the link, OK, uh, from Twitter under the Zipkin project. Um, here, we have people who talk about their sites. So for example, Line themselves I use Elasticsearch. Uh, so you can see what their setup is. And is, so this can be some help, help too. So I think the two things for helpful when you're trying to integrate with a product, actually three. One, can you or can you not? <laughs> Good answer, right? Next. Um, what are some examples of integration? Because I want to see, not just tell, uh, what, it, what are other people doing? And then three, contact those people. So we use a Gitter for questions. We keep a wiki with site de details. And we also have some documentation, usually in the readmes. Other question? Question was, does Zipkin support protocols besides HTTP? Yes. Um, so. We only really specify um, f formats in two ways. So I talk about the Zipkin API project a few times. This is a pretty easy one to follow because we don't, we don't um, do too much work here. We only change this one when we actually change protocol or data format. So in this case, when I say protocol, I'm talking about the data exchange format, meaning that we have a data format in protocol buffers, we used to use Thrift, but mostly we have uh, JSON and, and uh, Protobuf. And we have uh, gRPC endpoint definition and also Open API, AKA Swagger. However, there's also how do you transport data to the system. So for example, out of the box, it has uh, Kafka and RabbitMQ and HTTP. And you can also uh, 
hook on the um, an ActiveM, ActiveMQ. You can also hook on Amazon SQS and Kinesis and some other things through third parties. So the main thing is, is that we focus on the data format because the actual data shipping part is a lot easier uh, than it is to, to define a format. So uh, did that answer your question? OK. Other questions? OK, you can have your beer. Thank you.